Hello, Breakfast Club viewers. Welcome to episode 52, which is extra, extra special because we are celebrating Black in Ento Week with three of the founders. Um, today, we are welcoming Dr. Marian Andrade, professor of uh, professor at University of Toronto Scarborough, Dr. Michelle Samuel Fu, director of specialty crop research at Alabama State University, and returning Breakfast Club guest, Dr. Jessica Ware, associate curator at the American Museum of Natural History. Hi, everybody. Hello Hi there. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. You've got an incredibly busy week happening. Um, so we're really appreciative that you took time. And um, so for folks who don't know, we are today, the title of today's panel is Black in Entomology. Um, and we are going to um, have a panel discussion with these three women um, about Black and Ento Week, which is a effort aimed at highlighting the diversity of work being done around the world by Black entomologists, and also kind of more broadly about diversity in entomology and science. So um, I'm gonna let um, you all kick it off yourself by doing some introductions. So let me go ahead and give you your slides. And um, Madian, will you go ahead and kick us off? I will start. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us and thank you for everybody who's listening in. We're really excited about Black and Entomology Week and we were just discussing before the cameras started that we've met all these entomologists that we didn't know existed. They've sort of come out of the woodwork. <laughs> so we're looking forward to the community here. So I'm Dr. Madian Andrade. I am a professor of biological sciences and ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Uh, I'm also special advisor to the Dean on Inclusive Recruitment and Equity Education. So I have sort of an administrative hat on. I'm president of the new Canadian Black Scientists Network, and you should look us up at blackscientists.ca. Um, and I'm a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I've always really uh, valued uh, public outreach and discussion about science in, in public, uh, because I think that is important, especially for publicly funded researchers like me. Um, and I maybe am going first because I'm not actually an entomologist. I'm here by stealth. Uh, I'm an arachnologist, which means I study spiders, eight legs, two body parts as opposed to six legs and three body parts. Um, but uh, quite often there's there's fewer of us than there are of entomologists, so we sort of sneak in there. Uh, their ecology also tends to be kind of comparable in some ways, and so uh, spiders like the ones here are what we study. We love studying them in the field in my lab, so we combine laboratory with field work because really we want to know what's playing out in the field. Um, we're interested in behavior, um, and so what you see here at the bottom is the Hastings Nature Reserve at UC Berkeley uh, facility, which we've been working at for several years, and on the left you see one season, on the right you see another season of the same field and we're interested in how those ecological changes affect things like the density and mating behavior of species like black widows which are our main study animals and that graph up top just shows you that the the relative density of males and females changes over the season. Um, in the corner, you see a, a redback spider, which is a type of black widow that we study in my lab. And it has two little red spots on its legs because people always say, how do you study things that are tiny like spiders in the field? And we mark them with colors. They have eight legs, we have lots of colors. So it's kind of like Bob, Joe and Fred. Um, and then in the up left, upper left, I just wanted to thank the Say Out First Nations who do give us access to their lands for studying species of black widows that live on the beach. Um, and in the next slide, I just wanted to show you the wide range of different types of people involved in this in my lab. Um, these are some of my graduate students, my undergraduates, and uh, even high school students who work in the lab. It takes a lot of people to raise the tens of thousands of spiders that we use for our experiments there. Um, and all of us are sort of motivated by uh, behaviors like the one in the lower right of the slide, which is a little video of a female black widow with two males courting her. And if we can click on that, you'll hear them and see them. What you're hearing is actually laser vibrometry, which is when we shine a laser on the, la on the web, it lets us hear what the spiders are saying to each other. And in that case, it was a female saying no thank you to that particular male. So with that, I will hand it off, I believe, next to Jessica. Oh no, sorry, next to Michelle, right? I think oh. we were going to go Jessica, but... Oh no, Michelle, sorry, sorry. Also, I have to say, no shade to the other panelists, but Median has the best Twitter name for at Widow Web. So. <laughs> Except people think I'm a widow. I occasionally get like, you need ah. to cut condolences or, you know, but no, it's Black Widows, yeah. <laughs> that, that's too funny, Medane. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Samuel Fu. I'm an entomologist at Alabama State University, which is in Montgomery, Alabama. Alabama State is an HBCU, so we are a historically black college and university, and I am actually in the Department of Biological Sciences, 
And here I am working on specialty crop research, specialty crop um, entomology, specifically industrial hemp. Um, I wear a couple of hats other than uh, the role that I have at Alabama State. This year, I will be serving as the president of the Southeastern branch of the Entomological Society of America. And I actually will be taking my reins next month when we have our annual meeting, which is going to be virtual thanks to uh, COVID-19. And I have all, I've been involved with um, entomology and the minority effort in entomology for quite some time now. And I've served previously as a two-term former president of the International Association of Black Entomologists. Um, Next slide, Jessica. And I, I only put together two slides, but I wanted to highlight um, some work that I've been doing or involved with since joining ASU since um, 2018. And one of the accomplishments that I'm really proud of, uh, so Alabama State is not a land grant institution, but I've been able to introduce um, very slowly sustainable agriculture and this discipline of entomology to the campus. In 2018, we actually received a grant from the Alabama Department of Specialty, the Alabama Department of Agriculture, one of their specialty crop uh, grants to get uh, an urban teaching garden started on campus. And these pictures that you're seeing here are an indication of what a true team effort it was. We had uh, two high tunnels and um, uh, the, the eight raised beds for the urban teaching garden, all of which was uh, built with um, student volunteer labor. So we really got our students um, interested and they came out in droves to help us with this effort. And I'd like to encourage you guys, if you're interested to see what we're doing with um, teaching, uh, teaching gardening and entomology at ASU to follow us on social media and our handle is up there on the screen for you. Thanks and I'll look forward to the discussion. All right, I suppose I'm up next. Um, and I'm a curator at the American Museum of Natural History where I study uh, dragonflies and damselflies, termites and cockroaches. Um, and much like uh, Michelle and Midian, I also have been involved in other types of volunteerism and leadership to try and work to diversify our field. Um, so I serve as the vice president in, of the Entomological Society of America. Um, as well, I'm the president of the Worldwide Dragonfly Association. And I've worked on some initiatives uh, with colleagues to form a collective called the Entomologists of Color, which works to diversify um, the field of entomology. And so as, uh, you know, maybe the same, maybe Michelle and, and maybe Anne feel the same way, but the reason why I got kind of involved in, in entomology in general was because of a love of insects and being outside. And so much of what I do as a field biologist is to kind of travel and try and, uh, you know, document biodiversity um, and understand the species that we're, we're interested in studying. Are you done? Is that yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it. <laughs> and see. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Let me remove the slides so we can have all our panelists get larger again. And I'll say before we move into the discussion too, viewers, um, no matter where you're watching, whether you're watching on Academy channels, whether you're watching on um, the American Museum of Natural History channels, you are welcome to leave comments and questions for our panelists at any time. Um, we're going to make this discussion pretty robust. So hopefully, like, I'm not, but I'm not promising that we'll get to questions at the end is what I'm trying to say. But if we do have time, we absolutely will loop those in. So please do say hi in the comments and um, let us know if you're enjoying it and all that good stuff. And I wanna back for our first question, I wanna back it way, way, way up and ask the panelists to just explain what entomology actually is. But I wanna add a arachnology to that. And look, I, Median, I have, look, I have a, a, a mug from our arachnologists at the Academy. <laughs> So <laughs> solidarity, um, right. but, but yeah, Michelle, will you get us started and just explaining more about entomology itself? Sure, I'd be happy to. So entomology is actually a very broad branch of zoology, which is the overall study of animals. 
and entomology with with entomology we study insects we study the interactions of insects with other organisms or with humans or with the environment um, entomologists work in a variety of fields you can specialize like we all all of us on the screen here on the show today we all work in a different area of entomology i i consider myself an agricultural entomologist so i work with specialty crops or i've, I've worked previously with row crops in um controlling in deciding how insect pests interact and how they might affect yields of the various crops that we're growing. You can be a, a med vet entomologist, you can work for the park systems, There, you can be a molecular geneticist working in entomology. There are a lot of different areas. Jessica, you wanna talk about what type of entomology you work in? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I guess the work that I do in my lab almost kind of borders on, like you mentioned, molecular biology or cellular biology. We're really interested in genome evolution um, and we use DNA and genomics to kind of unravel the evolutionary history of these insects. And so we're working in the same way that a molecular biologist might be working a lot of the days. It's just that we're working on insects instead of- no. <laughs> Yeah, and like I said, I'm an arachnologist, so so it, it's a different kind of critter. It is a different group of organism um, with the two body parts and the eight legs, but essentially the range of things that, that people do with arachnids are similar to, to entomology. So we in our lab are interested in evolutionary ecology um, and understanding how differences in the environment uh, mediated by behavior can affect species diversity, resilience, and things like invasiveness. So um, we use a lot of the same tools, I think. We use ecological um, the techniques as well as molecular techniques. But the, what I love about working on, on spiders is that we are both kind of one of you in terms of terrestrial arthropods, but we're also our own distinct little weird group <laughs> with our own kitsch. <laughs> and your own jewelry. Exactly. <laughs> Which you didn't wear today. Although I have to say Jessica's is impressive. That's true. Oh, thanks. Do you, do you shop Halloween sales? I feel like there's a lot of spider related jewelry around Halloween. I cannot Halloween. tell you how much. <laughs> I cannot tell you how much. My office is packed with spider kitsch from Halloween and also from like artists and things like that who just focus on that. That's it. And what's so cool too about that when you all describe your areas of work, like it's so expansive in terms of just stuff that hits human beings in all these different areas. So, um, really, really amazing. And that also I think sets us up well to set, to ask or like start to tell people um, just what actually the um, Black in Ento Week is and like what it involves and encompasses. And Jessica, maybe you can kick us off. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I guess in the middle of last year, uh, there were a few initiatives that were Black in birding, Black in neuro, Black in yeah. chemistry, Black in marine science. Um, and so a group of us thought, wouldn't it be great if we kind of highlighted the work of Black entomologists? And I know that um, for Marianne and for Michelle, for myself, for many of us, we often have worked in departments um, or industry or museums where we're the only uh, Black entomologist there. And so sometimes it can feel kind of lonely. And sometimes you might wonder, am I actually the only person who's a Black person doing entomology or arachnology? And so these groups, these, these weeks, these theme weeks, uh, they serve a purpose to kind of educate the public about our discipline, the breadth of our discipline, but it also is community building and visibility campaigns so that people can, you know, get to reimagine what they think of when they think of an entomologist. Entomologists are, are, are people that look like all the people on the call here, just as much as, as, as any other type of human. Um, so through this week, we, we planned a bunch of different types of initiatives, ones that focus on art and entomology, on, um, I'm not going to pronounce it right. Uh, entom entomophagy, uh, you know, eating insects, um, uh, getting into undergraduate research, graduate careers, um, intersectional identities for those of us who are members of other groups as well as being black entomologists, um, as well as, you know, getting involved in leadership in societies and scientific societies like what uh, Dr. Samuel Fu was talking about for the Entomological Society of America. And then um, we also will be discussing decolonizing um, entomology and then. There's some fun events too. You know, at the <laughs> night, we're gonna do a movie co-watch and kind of talk about the fact and fiction and the different movies and then do a tour of our workspaces. Um, so I think, uh, you know, maybe Anne and, and Michelle chime in here, but I think it's it's a week that has something for everybody um, of all ages. We, I think we wanna try to get other people that are not as familiar with our work or our science interested and excited about entomology the way we are. I listened to Jessica talk and she can talk for hours about dragonflies. 
I can talk for a really long time about pesticides or why we why we should consider GMOs or even just urban gardening. And oftentimes if people have not met an entomologist before, you know, they don't necessarily share our passion. And I, I feel as if having this week long series of events to highlight being black in entomology, we're gonna get the opportunity to showcase our work to the world and uh, to others that might not even know that this was a discipline, an area that they yeah. could have as a career. Yeah. And the best way to keep up with everything that's happening this week is your Twitter account and website. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay, great. I'll drop the links for those in comments in just a moment. Um, Maybe and Jessica, oh, did anyone else want to add anything on that one? Because I was just going to shift into the next. Great. Just, I just said a lot of the things will be recorded as well. So do keep track oh, of yeah. these things. You can see them later. Yeah, great. And someone asked this in comments, but if you are not able to watch this program live right now too, it'll just live as a static video exactly on the same link afterwards. So you can finish it anytime. Um, but Mariana, I was going to move to you and just say that um, Jessica alluded to some of the reasons why Black and Ento Week is important and necessary, but can you take us even a bit deeper into that and just why do we need to have events like this? Yeah, for sure. I'll talk about it in general. So these Black in X weeks that have been highlighting Black people in different types of science fields, they, they really are important. And that's become clear. I think it was always clear to people in Black communities, but less so maybe to people who weren't in Black communities until last year. Um, and that is the recognition that there's actually systematic uh, structures and racism that keeps people who are Black out of professionals of all kinds, but especially out of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and in some fields, we actually have data on the rate at which students in, you know, let's say, in the high school or elementary school level actually are being discouraged if they're Black from pursuing these kinds of fields because people just either don't believe they can do it because of stereotypes or because they just don't see themselves in it. Mm -hmm. I had this, uh, so there's work to be done inside and outside the community, and these kinds of weeks do both. Um, I do have this one anecdote from giving a talk at a scholarship reception for high school students. And one of the parents, who was a principal, mind you, at another school, came up to me, um, a black parent, and said, you know, my son's been picking up those nasty bugs since he was five years old, and I tell him to put them down. But after your talk, I'm going to let him pick them up. <laughs> and that, that kid ended up working in my lab as a high school co-op student. So I don't know if he's working on bugs now, but I hope he's out there somewhere. <laughs> That's so cool. These events are also just as as someone who works in a museum, I think they're also have had such a huge impact on people's discussion about who's visible in museum spaces, you know, and who gets led into those areas as well. And um, how the reality of what you see when you go into a science museum today really doesn't like reflect the actual true diversity and vibrance of the people driving the work. Um, so, yeah, the impacts of, are so far, far reaching and, and, it's, and it's been such an amazing year for that. Um, so in terms of doing um, or being a black entomologist and doing the work, um, Michelle, I wonder if you can kind of talk us through some of the challenges of, of trying to navigate that work as a black woman or person. So I'll, I'll start off by saying, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what my other co-panelists have to add, but um, the challenges that I think are inherent, uh, they, they relate a lot to what made May, May Diane Maydean. Maydean or Maydean, either one. I'm going to get it right by the end of the, the call. A lot of what she's referred to, sometimes there's systemic uh, racism that's built into the science. And I feel as if sometimes um, academia on the whole can sometimes be a closed loop, whereas um, it's a self-interested system that only benefits those individuals that have been well-established and they they derive individual benefits from being a part of this long-standing system and sometimes it's hard to be on the outside looking in if you identify differently if you look differently or in my case you know i i also sound a little bit different and I'm, I'm of um i'm from the caribbean originally and so i've had to modify the way that i speak so that i'm not continuously asked if what did you just say can you please repeat yourself um but there are a lot of challenges within within uh, this 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 whole industry of STEM and, and entomology. Um, I'd say also that there is probably a hierarchy of inequality. So sometimes the opportunities aren't the same uh, depending on um, depending on the individual, your your mentor, depending on um, the institution that you, you that you attended. Maybe there might be a lack of mentorship. Um, 
there, there are a number of challenges and I'll, I'll pass it off to the others to, to have them chime in. Yeah, I think it can be really, like you mentioned, Michelle, it can be hard to get involved, especially if you don't see people who look like you. I mean, many of us would probably, uh, I'm not sure if you had the same experience, but I've never had a black teacher. Um, and I certainly didn't have know any black entomologists other than myself. And for years in odontology, which is the study of dragonflies and damselflies, um, I was the only black person that attended any of the society meetings. And so there is some part of, I guess, imposter system imposter syndrome or something that says in my brain, maybe I'm not supposed to be here because I'm, I'm like, nobody else is here but me, it looks like me. And so I think that there's also some, it's, it's like, you may not know that it exists, that's one possibility, but also you might know it exists, but we might self-select ourselves out as well, just because we feel like we don't see ourselves reflected here. And so maybe this isn't a space for us. And it can be even little things, like when you're a graduate student and you're applying to graduate school and you go for the grad school interview, Sometimes the only black people we see for the entire day are people at the airport when we leave and, or, or come for the interview. And the same could be said for a job interview. And so I think all of these things are kind of messages that 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 kind of help shape, like Michelle was saying, kind of help shape who stays in and who who is on the outside. Yeah, I agree. And actually, it's interesting you mentioned applying for graduate school. It was the first time I'd stepped, I went to graduate school at Cornell, and it was the first time I'd stepped foot on a Ivy League institution campus, right? I was first in family, my generation's a first in family to go to university. And something as simple as all the grad students were there at the same time, I was the only person of color, although there was actually a black professor in the department at the time, which was amazing, the first time I'd ever seen that. Um, I didn't know what to wear. And some of y'all be laughing, but I knew I was gonna be the only black person in the room and I didn't know what to wear. And I still choke up when I remember that feeling, right? So some things that you might not see as barriers, that means you walk in unsure of yourself to begin with, you see no one else who looks like you and no one acknowledges that you might be having a different experience. Yeah. So to my white allies, I'll often say, you know, you don't have to know what to do, but if you say, I understand that you may have an experience that I don't, have and that I don't understand, how can I help that, you know, weight lifted? <laughs> yeah. Um, since we were talking about society, going to society meetings and just kind of belonging at those upper echelons, assuming you make it through the first handful of years, I wanted to just um, ask Jessica you'd, for you to talk about ENTO POC, because I know that's one of the, um, it seems like a good place to talk about that and the work that you're trying to do kind of more specific to that. Oh, sure. Uh, well, you know, uh, we're a collective um, that has a three-pronged approach. You know, our goals are to recruit and retain, um, you know, a diversity of scientists and entomology, but then also to do, to chip away at this, at the system, you know, to change the mm -hmm. system, um, you know, through advocacy and activism. And I think, you know, when you look at the numbers, they're, they're rather staggering. So in the United States, the National Science Foundation is an organization that collects numbers. Um, and the numbers of, of, of black, you know, they kind of group entomology and parasitology together. But the numbers of black PhDs are like staggeringly low compared to what the, the you know, the human proportion of black people are in the population. Um, and that's be, in part because of, you know, systemic practices. So we, provide free memberships to any person of color, any student of color who wants to join a scientific society, up to three scientific societies they can become members of. We've had registration campaigns, we've paid for registration for them to attend conferences so they can meet their peers, so they can present their research, they can have access to the, the journals in which they wanna publish. We also have a journal club which just started up. And so we've given away over 300 memberships and, and many of those students are now coming together and meeting uh, to learn from, from mentors, how to read scientific journals, how to how to read articles and interpret them. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is give the the this hidden curriculum that a lot of our white peers might, might receive through their schooling, through their family. We're trying to give that so that we can level the playing field and really make it so that these students are gonna be able to succeed in our discipline. Hidden curriculum is really powerful. You think about all the support that is not that's not visible, but is very real and actually and contributes really concretely. Um, so that's entopoc.com, is that right? Um, yeah, and we also are on Twitter and we highlight the instar. We call, so in insects, there's, <laughs> uh, as you develop, they're, you know, as insects develop, they go through these stages called instars. And so uh, the students who are profiled as part of Entopoc are called instars. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag diversify entomology. 
hashtag NWPOC or Insta our profiles, um, and you'll see them. And, and each student gets to kind of tell their story uh, about the in, their favorite insects and what they work on, and you can find out more information. And I, I think the exciting thing about this is some of the people who were NWPOC, it's only been around for you know, a very short period of time, some of them have started applying for graduate school now uh, and getting acceptances and that's, that's kind of exciting to see. And never let it be said again that someone who's organizing a symposium or organizing, you know, a, a, the seminar for their department, never let it be said again, well, I'd like to have some black entomologists, but there just aren't any. <laughs> lists are out there. We, like, the lists are out there. Yeah, like, like, here they are. Work, what they work on are out there. So, I mean, it, it's a nice one-stop shop to kind of find out who's working on what. Yeah. Well, I mentioned your website specifically, too, because you take donations. If people are watching, you're like, that work sounds amazing. Um, and and, and Laurel, I, I just want to add to what Jessica pointed out. Not only are we trying to chip away at the system, but we want to normalize yeah. seeing a black face in entomology. Sometimes when you go to professional meetings um, and after the talks are over, because um, everybody everybody's free to attend whatever talk they're interested in, but afterwards, when it's time to uh, go to dinner or, or go to get, get coffee during one of the breaks. You want to talk about um, the science that you just learned and not necessarily with the same group of people at your university or in your department. But, you know, you want to see a couple of faces that look like yours more and more in increasing numbers so that not only are we normalizing black faces in STEM and in entomology, but we can slowly move into leadership roles so that we are um, influencing decision-making and policy so that our voices and our unique interests can be addressed. Yeah. Yeah, I'll read you this comment from David who just wrote, I'm sharing this on my social media. When I think of entomology, I think of white males, but not anymore. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask just a question as you're kind of talking about the challenges of being black in entomology too, the, you know, with, with science and with the kind of work that I think all of you do, there comes field work as well. And I wondered if you think if there, if there are challenges that are, if you're parsing challenges specific to work areas and then specific to these field work often in other countries or remote areas, um, wondered if any of you had thoughts on that. Yeah, field work is a, I mean, field work is challenging for everyone, I think, but, um, there's there's the women. We're all women. Right. <laughs> um, there's certain risks inherent in going to to isolated places potentially, or places that are a little bit less secure, um, and that ha that really need to be kept in mind. But then on top there, uh, there's the the racialization um, challenges. So, you know, uh, we we know from a variety of unfortunate events that black people are susceptible to being targeted in ways that other people aren't. Uh, racialized people in general, though, you're, you're, are you by the side of the road collecting? Is someone going to wonder what you're doing? Are you heading into the bush someplace in a, in a national park? Is Are people going to ask what's in your bag? Why are you wearing that headlight? Are you near my windows? Uh, it, I mean, it, it goes on and on and it all um, intersects with the stereotypes about uh, black people being up to no good or um, so. Uh, there are definite challenges and, and you have to consider it when you when you create work plans for going in the field uh, for students as well. And on a lighter note, sometimes a challenge is, and we were discussing this a little bit before we went live on air, sometimes a challenge is as a black woman, how am I going to wear my hair in the field? <laughs> and, and how am I going to protect my hair? How am I going to wash my hair? Like, and, and us as, um, I don't want to say as experts, but as as women that are emerging leaders in this area, you know, we can we can help uh, not have new graduate students try to reinvent the wheel, but you know, share some of our experiences so that they have a head start and a platform from which they can leap into, uh, you know, navigating some of those low level challenges that aren't necessarily experienced by people that aren't uh, of different um, ethnicities or different persuasions. Right. I remember when I went to the field with my uh, advisor, we went to Australia and I was pregnant. So I think you're a little bit more sensitive to the sun or maybe it's just an old wives tale, I'm not sure. But um, I was very sensitive to the sun, but my advisor who's white male said, well, you, uh, he was slathering on you know, sunblock. And he said, this was 2003. He said, well, you don't really need to use this, do you? Um, wow. So I, I think there's a lot of, you know, I think that, and that was when I was a graduate student and, and I had my own sunblock, so it was fine. But I mean, there's a lot of these, these, these pervasive ideas or misunderstandings about black bodies or about 
about black self care or or whatever it is that I think shape sometimes advisor it, in mentoring that maybe I mean I think he thought he was trying to help me out. Right. Uh, and so I think that Michelle's exactly right. You know, having you know black people that uh, are entomologists who can be mentors, they actually can set the the tone for the whole lab. You know, we all need some luck. We all may be concerned about this or that uh, to kind of make it smooth and more normalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't know what your most interesting field story is. I think some of my mine are when I was. Um, I had a baby and my parents actually came to a, a, stay near the field site so that they could take care of our baby during the day. Oh, wow. um, but I had I took my breast pump with me into the field and I would just tell my grad student, okay, go over the rise, I need to use <laughs> breast pump. <laughs> you know? And he said, breast pump's our friend because it means we can do field work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Do, does anyone else wanna, um, before I kind of ask the next questions, does anyone else wanna add anything else on this, to this one, to their answers on this one? I would just say that maybe uh, as advisors, whether you're um, you know, a black entomologist or not, if you're not a member of the black community, it, it really, it, now, if not, if you haven't thought about it before, now it's the time to really think about making a plan for your students, assuming that you're going to have a diversity of students going to the field, you know, having a field work safety plan um, that could involve things to do with hair or sunblock or whatever, but it could also involve things to do with being, you know, LGBTQ in the field or, or you know, going to uh, collect on a farm where there's, you know, you know, bigot bigotry or, or what have you. Having a plan and talking about it openly, um, mm -hmm. even though it's scary sometimes for people to want to, you know, to talk about race, it's a luxury to not talk about it because black students are going to have to think about it. And so you want to be, if you're a mentor, you really want to. Be a, be, be a guide and provide some logistics and some support in this area so they can make a, a safe plan. And if we're serious about recruiting and retaining the best talent, we have to recognize that that's gonna come in a variety of experiences, a variety of looks, a variety of shades, a variety of ethnicities. And to truly retain this talent, we have to normalize and, and equalize the playing field. And if it's as simple as having that safety plan that Jessica alluded to for your uh, student of color, then I think that's pretty low hanging fruit for us to all try to accomplish. Right. And to your point, like those conversations, if you're not used to having them for advisors can be uncomfortable and you might say things weird or feel weird or whatever. But the more you do them, the more you normalize having conversations that are that open, the better the space is for everybody. Right. right. It's like, yeah. Um, OK, so so we've talked a, a, a bit about the challenges, but I want to ask also, does being black in entomology bring with it a perspective or other skills or advantages that you also kind of want to want to call out specifically here? And and maybe and maybe I'll have you start this one. Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I think. Um, I think you are often coming from a different perspective because we come from communities that typically, as we say, are not, uh, or from some of us anyway, aren't as deeply involved historically with uh, university systems or the types of systems that you engage with. So what we might find interesting or question uh, or want to do more research on could be slightly different than people who are sort of more uh, in, entrenched in the, in the established uh, orthodoxies. Um, but there, there can be, a, so it's a it's a disadvantage and advantage. I call it the, the visible invisibility problem, um, which is sometimes you go to these meetings and you think, oh, I'm the only one again, and it's so tedious. But when you rock a talk, everyone remembers you. Everyone <laughs> remembers you. You're the only one, right? And, and um, therefore, sorry, Nadine, you take advantage of that because everyone remembers you and they're going to remember what you had to say and you'll get emails afterwards and then it's up to you to respond to those and start broadening and building your network. Right. That's right. So find that silver lining and that's definitely one of them. Yeah. Great. Um, so I guess that, um, yeah, and I just, sorry, I'm just like going off script, but I, yeah, I just, every time people, you know, as we it, have more and more of these conversations that are really just about like, you know, bringing your whole self to work. It's like the more that you do that, the more people, you know, the biggest that you're trying to crack here in terms of like helping people, the mainstream public change their perspectives is like by being an entire person when you do actual work, like you are bringing these this other point of view and these other problem solving skills and these other kinds of creativity. And it's just like, this is what we actually need to make science work. And it's always been that way. So like we have a lot of work to catch up to like the way we actually should be doing science and should be solving problems and you know other fields as well. So 
I'm um, just really glad that you're all here and talking. So <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I, think that, I think a lot of the, I mean, there's, there have been, you know, scientific studies that have looked at productivity and output um, when there's a diverse team, when there's a team led by a woman mentor and what have you. And I think, I, I mean, I haven't read every single paper, but the majority that I read seem to, is a kind of, we're converging on this idea that, you know, statistically significantly higher output in terms of research and, and scientific creativity and what have you. I mean, the benefits to a university, the benefits to industry, uh, it's there. I mean, we have, we have data that really kind of underscores the need for this, that underscores the need for, for these initiatives. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting because like being on the receiving end of social media accounts during my day job, you get whenever we whenever we talk about events like this or promote them, you always get the people who are like, why why can't scientists just talk about science? Mm. You know, and it's oh, just can like, I answer? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I realized, so I, I gave an interview the other day and they introduced me as the activist professor, blah, blah, blah. And it shook me for a minute. And then I realized I am an activist and university and science made me an activist because I have never able to just be a scientist. I want to just be a scientist, but when I see things not changing, when I see people junior to me who are having such a hard time, who are not allowed to actually name what's happening to them, I realize that I, you know, as a full rank professor, I have an obligation to start engaging with these issues. And the reason why we need a black in X is not because Jessica, Michelle and I are three flavors of the same ice cream. <laughs> it's because we are actually as likely to be similar to a white person listening to this as we are to each other. And yet others don't see it that way. Right. We are treated similarly in certain ways because of our visible characteristics. And that does affect our science and it affects our ability to just get on with the job. So that is my answer to that question, which I hear also hear all the time. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to add to that one before I ask another? I would just say that I think that kind of to build upon what, what Marianne said, there as a researcher, there's this invisible tax, right, of the extra work that you do. I can remember when I first met Marianne, actually, when I was a graduate student, Marianne, we were in this kind of women in science lunch thing, or I forget what it was, and Marianne said, she turned and she said to me, you're going to be asked to be on a lot of committees and you need to let people know. I kept that in my brain and I was like, I wonder if that's going to be true. Boy, it is true, yeah. you know? Uh, and so there's this invisible tax where people of color, I think in our science, get get asked to do a lot of extra work that doesn't necessarily get included for promotion or for what have you. And so I think it's important to, that's why we have to talk about it because it's still a thing, you know? <laughs> if we're doing yeah. an extra 20 hours a week um, or 20 hours a month on on DEI issues for, the, for free, for the industry and university, maybe that means we still need to talk about it. It's what I would say. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so so entom so within entomology specifically, what what is that field doing to tackle um, DEI issues? And I, and Jessica, I'll ask you to just keep talking because um, and we talked a bit about ento POC before, but but yeah, so like broadly, what's happening in the space now? I'm actually kind of really inspired. Um, I think. Not that I haven't had a good experience in entomological societies, I have, and I've certainly volunteered for a lot because it was such a positive experience. But I always had the idea that if we talked about race, that it would, everything would come crashing down, the house of cards would fall, I wouldn't be invited again, and it would be kind of over. But that's not the case, I'm actually amazed. I mean, the Dragonfly Society of Americas um, is like, I, I guess I know dragonfly things, so I'll talk about the dragonfly <laughs> groups that I know. Um, you know, when I first started going to those, I was the only person of color that went. And, and actually, one of the only women, they used to call women net bag holders. They were the people that held the nets for the men, you know? Um, <laughs> no, oh, they had a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And they, they published articles in the newsletter about about race and, and entomology and, and odontology. I mean, it's amazing. Think groups that, you know, I just feel like we would be, if you look at any entomological society right now, this is one of the top issues in their strategic plans and their goals of what they're working on. And it's just so great to see. I mean, I think that we're on the cut, we're on like a precipice of, of change. You know, I think that we're gonna see a dramatic change in the way that society has worked just because of their, you know, everyone's rolling up their sleeves yeah. and ready to kind of start working. I don't know if, if Michelle and Marianne feel the same way, but certainly for dragonflies, I'm, I'm just so impressed and amazed at, 
at the willingness, I guess, of my peers to to kind of really put this at the forefront of what they put their money and time towards. I'll, I'll add that within the, the National Entomological Society of America, I've definitely seen a, a change in the, the narrative or the approach. And perhaps this was always there, just not visible to me, but within the last year or so, I, uh, I've been asked to serve on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for my branch, for the Southeastern branch. So I'm the branch member. And every month we have these scheduled meetings and I leave every one of those meetings feeling so encouraged because there's there's such broad representation, first of all, on the call and the ideas are just so, they're fresh and, and, and they're solid ideas. A lot of them being driven by graduate students. And I just, I feel really inspired, like Jessica said, because this means that there's a whole generation after us, these instars that are gonna mature. <laughs> And, you know, that will move into leadership roles. And I hope that this energy that they have um, continues to evolve. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I just want to call out um, all the folks who aren't Black who are doing this work, because we we didn't see that before. And that is the real change. Like Ento allies, even though I know, Jessica, you're one of the Ento allies. It, it's a lot of uh, predominantly white graduate students who are doing this work and, and some faculty, too. So really, that's great. And are you all seeing differences? Oh, sorry, did I cut someone off, Michelle? No. Oh, okay. Are you all seeing differences in your um, your kind of subject area, your specific field? So arachnology versus pest management versus um, evolution work? Or are there areas? I find it hard to say because I'm kind of unplugged because of the COVID. Like we didn't get our conferences. Yeah. We did. What what I did see is that after the uh, the George Floyd murder, um, a lot of organizations put out statements and and that was across entomology and arachnology etc and the ones that were weak got called out <laughs> by allies and and it was you know it's a wave so i think i think the committees are really doing the work and and i think that's across all of these societies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um okay so for folks watching today or um and we have had a couple um i think there's a couple of uh younger at least a couple of younger girls watching. Um, oh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> You're real close. Um, how can how can Black people or more Black people get involved in entomology? Um, and maybe and maybe I'll ask you to to do to lead this one as well. Sure. I mean, I think it is just seeking out those opportunities. So um, we actually during the week have a how to get into ento research. Um, session which is today i think later is it not jessica um and so but but in general whatever institution you're in you can seek out opportunities to volunteer um, or ideally get paid to work in someone's lab you can also just head out in the woods there are awesome guides online field guides how to guides how to collect how to identify things you can reach out to those of us online through at black and ento or any of the people you saw on the roll call the thing about nerds is that we love sharing our nerdiness with others. So I actually, one of my colleagues wrote to me just last week and said, my six-year-old says she wants to be a spider scientist. So I tweeted on Twitter because I didn't know for six-year-olds, I said, what's the best? And like, I got 12 responses in like 10 minutes, right? So, and people who are gonna live stream their tarantulas for her. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so just, just look around and if you can't find us in your local area, then try us on Twitter. Awesome. And else? there, I'm sorry, there are also opportunities with um, specific organizations such as 4-H or Future Farmers of America that the K through 12, uh, that target demographic can uh, try to get involved with. There's usually an extension um, group within each of, each of the major communities and perhaps there's one at your local community that you can get in contact with or even just your, your local regional extension office, uh, send them an email, you know, call out the extension agent and they, if they don't have the answer, I'm, I'm, I can put my head on a block and say that they will have an idea of the resources that might be available. Maybe there is a, an entomologist or a scientist um, at the local university that they could link you up so that you could go visit their lab, you could tour their lab, tour their greenhouses, just get an idea of what it is like to work hands-on in uh, and expand your interest in entomology. And I would just add at the end to say that many scientific societies actually have resources available for people who are K-12, like um, I know that the Dragonfly Society of America have, you know, 
little curricula that you can do with with dragonflies in your own home with just you know household items. Um, so I think that you know if you if you're interested in arachnids, if you're interested in termites, if you're interested in beetles, um, there's a coleopterous society, which is the order that it is be that are beetles. You know, the diptera society. You can look at their website, and they have you know kind of often a little section that are for for younger members or for for people who want to get involved. Awesome. And for people who aren't black, um, entomologists and otherwise, how can they help to support better diversity in entomology? Um, I, I'm going to tackle this one. I say just be open to mentoring, be responsive if you get a request for assistance. Um, and just you generally want to be so authentic in your response that you want to foster a culture of inclusivity. Um, you, 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 I think it's very easy to, um, I don't want to say crush, but to dispirit an individual if if they don't get a response. Maybe they, they'll think that um, my question was, was not a smart one or this person just thought that um, I wasn't even worth a response. I try to respond to every email that I get, whether it's a, a mom mm -hmm. that, that, has, um, that needs help with their six-year-old's uh, science project, or, or they, they, they need help finding resources, or they want to learn more about a specific entomology society, um, group that I may, I may not be a specialist in that area, but even though I don't work with dragonflies, I know someone that does, and I can put them in touch with Jessica, or, or now that I know Maydeen, May I can put them in, in, in touch with her, and, you know, and, and that way we build the network. And so it, it doesn't just have to be this, you know, small group of, of individuals helping each other, but I think we can take it to all entomologists. Mm -hmm. And yes, it means oftentimes going beyond, you know, your regular work day and we're all swamped. We all have a million things to do. We're all pulled in a million directions, but you know, it, it takes less than two minutes to respond to a 10 year old's email about this, this fascinating bug that they found. Right. And, you know, that way you, you encourage their curiosity and encourage their interest in the science that we all love. I would I would add that another thing people could do is really get I think all of the things that Michelle said make are, are make will make a if if every person did what Michelle just described already, that would have a tremendous impact. Um, but then for the retention piece, I think, you know, getting it's there's no shame in, in saying that we don't necessarily know the best tools for mentoring a diversity of students. Mm -hmm. You know, that's okay to say. That's okay to say. I mean, I don't know. I didn't necessarily know until I, you know, you can you can try and train yourself. There's there are books that one's can, that one can read. Um, there are, are workshops that one one can attend. And really giving ourselves the, the tools so that we can be successful mentors. Um, that's part of what we do as scientists. Is we we build our skill sets. Well, this is a skill set, you know, building building the tools so that you can be an effective mentor to a diversity of students is really important. And it's not something that's intuitive, because if so, then maybe everybody would already be doing it. Everyone would be an A1 mentor. So <laughs> you know, train yourself. And I'll yeah. take it from the opposite side of the, the career. So once people are already in the career, be a sponsor, say their names when they're not in the room, uh, mm -hmm. suggest them for talks. If you're invited to give a talk as a plenary speaker or on a panel and you see there's no diversity on that panel, say that you're not going. I mean, that, that sounds radical, but especially if you're a full rank professor already or you're already in your profession, you don't need that panel, but you can apply a little pressure and say, hey, you know, there are people in the world who don't look like this <laughs> and maybe we can invite some of them and I'll even offer you a name. If you don't have those names, check out our websites, check out our roll calls um, and we'll help you out. Yeah, that's good. I was gonna ask if there were ways specifically that people who were in the field at any level could non-black people in the field at any level could help take some of that tax off that you kind of mentioned earlier. That sounds like one way to do it, but are there others that you would just help people see more clearly? Well, um, I, I didn't mean to jump. I don't want to cut anybody off. I would just say that I think one thing that's important for, for non-black scientists to remember is that like, like Michelle and Median have already said, we're, we're trying to do our science too, and we're busy uh, trying to get our research programs. Uh, we're mentoring students. We're doing all of these things. So uh, sometimes, you know, well-meaning, you know, really good intentioned people uh, don't realize the burden that they're putting by asking for, you know, free advice or free labor when it comes to DEI issues. And there are some things that maybe it is the best thing to do is to talk to a black entomologist directly. But other times there are things that one can do, again, to the training piece. 
you know, to do some some prior to do some of the homework and to volunteer for some committees and to you know give your time for DEI efforts and initiatives like the committee that that Michelle was talking about um, at the scientific societies. Not leaving the work um, just to your colleagues of color uh, can be a really great gift, you know, to of time, the gift of time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask each of you for um, kind of last thoughts, even though I feel like you've given us so much profundity already, but I'll just remind viewers or not remind you, but let you know, like we are going to have time for a handful of questions. So if you have something to ask our panelists, go ahead and get those in now. We already have some waiting. Um, but yeah, is there is there anything else that you, and it's impossible to, to cram everything into just a short panel, but is there anything else that you would like viewers to hear you say right now? I'll go ahead and get started. I, I just want to say that I think that the past year is the 2020s, that, that social justice movement that we all saw and witnessed, I think that it exemplifies the need for us to try to level the playing field so that we are represented, um, so that we're counted, so that we're included in decision making. I'm, I'm really big on having a voice at the table when decisions are being made to um, to influence funding, to influence a particular direction, to influence policy. and it's important that us as um, scientists of color and entomologists of color, that we step up to the plate too when those, when those opportunities are offered. Uh, we, we, we cannot just be about lip service, but we have to have actions that follow through. And if we're asking for um, to be included and to have a seat at, at the table, when there, is a, um, when there is a call for us to, to um, to volunteer, not to add to the, not to add to the, to the the week's work, but you know to make sure that you step up into those roles so that we can then you know we our voices can be heard and we can slowly start to normalize seeing black faces in these leadership roles. Yeah. And I guess I would say briefly that people often talk about doing the work. And I mean, as scientists, I, I was like, I don't even know what that means. Like, can you specify it with some variables, please? <laughs> but I'll tell you, for me, a really important basic personal part of that is learning to hear what people is, are saying without engaging defensiveness and without engaging a tendency to try to make it not so because of what it means about you. And that's the work that I've seen people doing over the past year that I think is so critical. I've spent my entire career learning how to edit what I say um, so that I don't offend other people. And it's time for people to start doing the work in understanding what's actually happening independent of them and how it makes them feel. That's such a good point. I guess I would just, uh, if I had a final, final parting note, it would just be uh, to speak to those um, who are black in the audience and say, uh, we've all been in your spot where we were just starting, you know, maybe out or maybe we're in grad school, maybe we're in high school. Um, it may not seem like there's a lot of us, but there are. And if you look, um, you know, we've done a roll call and there are people from all over the world that were kind of tweeting about their work. Um, there's a lot of us, uh, and uh, you know, you're not you're not you're not the only one by any means. Um, and there's a whole group of, of people that are eager to collaborate with you. So don't give up. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I meant to ask, <clears throat> I realized I skipped a question, which is just how many black entomologists do you think there are? And <laughs> the answer is tons. But like, did you want to call that out more specifically? Well, I would just say only that I, I happen to know one number off the top of my head, but maybe Michelle and Midian uh, will think this is funny. So. There was a study that was done a few years ago, a sociological study that interviewed um, Black and Latinx uh, entomologists, people who self-identified. And at the time, that they did it just within the United States. At the time when they did that study, there were less than 100 uh, that identified, self-identified. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that number would be the same. I actually have wondered, you know, if who, who, who they were targeting and how they sent the message out and who responded to the survey. Uh, so I'm actually really curious about this topic. And so one of my colleagues at NTOPOC, Dominic Evangelista, is actually doing a survey. It's just going through IRB approval right now uh, this summer that will kind of hopefully have kind of a more global number. So that's all I would just mention. That's really cool. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask, I just realized I also need, 
to my computers are telling me about to die and I forgot to plug it in. So I have to crawl under my desk shortly. I told you this show was very professional. Um, <laughs> but I want, before I disappear into the desk just for a moment, I was gonna ask a question from Jennifer who would like to know, I'm gonna start with a fun one. Um, each of your favorite complete, you have to make a decision, favorite insects. Go. Uh. <laughs> I wonder if it can be an arachnid for you then, Midian. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I like insects too. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you entomologists have to go first. <laughs> All right, Michelle, you're up. All right. I think, I think I love, I really love the green lace wings. Um, oh yeah. Ooh, yeah. I remember being a graduate student and, uh, doing one of our collections, uh, one of our collecting assignments for insect taxonomy and wearing the light and going out late at night to the lake and um, just, you know, being surprised to, to find them on vegetation. And um, I, I've just always been fascinated with, with them. So they are definitely up there for me. I won't say they're my favorite, but they are among my favorite insects. Well, that's a good one. Well, I mean, I guess I al I always say dragonflies because, and it all, it, I'm on record, I think, many times as being interviewed saying <laughs> they should kind of dances, but inspired by Michelle, I'm actually going to, I'm going to veer away from the norm, and I'll say that it's, I would say, a mantispid. Oh, I love, them. I love them. I yes. love them. They have legs that look kind of like a praying mantis, but they're not mantises, and they're close relatives to Neuroptera, to the Neuroptoids that Michelle just talked about. That's what I would say. That's cool. <laughs> There's also a lot that are spider egg um, uh, foragers. So yeah, they're cool, but they're beautiful. Um, and I will veer away from spiders, although I think my favorite spider was on the title slide, which is a <laughs> Texas widow, but anyway. Um, and I have to say a little bright green curculonid, which is a snout beetle. These little tiny beetles, they're perfect. They're iridescent green. They've got a little snout, little antennae coming off the side. I just think they're beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's, okay. that's so cool. Um, I'll have to drop links to photos of all of those in the chats later. Um, I was going to read this comment from Camille who said, I'm so inspired by you all. Thank you. I will take your words with you, with me into my own science exploration and in the work I do with my high school students. Wonderful. Oh, so great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then I was going to ask a question from Megan who wanted to know, um, when doing outreach, do you have any tips for improving ento education in communities of color so that we can show all kids that science is for them? Did you want to go first, Michelle? <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to cut you off. I love, I, when I was in graduate school, one of my favorite things to do was to participate with the insect zoo at the University of Georgia. And selfishly, it's because I saw, even within my own children, just how excited they would be, even if they thought that the bugs were gross initially. But who doesn't want to hold a hissing, um, hissing cockroach and hear it hiss in your hand? Yeah. So I, I think just having live specimens, I know maintaining an insect zoo is um, can be challenging. Sometimes it can be expensive, but linking up with your local entomology department at um, wherever you live, you know, if there's a, a department of entomology at a local university or a college, um, or maybe even in the biology department, just getting some guidance there, but having live, live insects or live specimens will bring any child that even if they think the insect is gross and they're afraid, they're going to be curious too, and they want to see it. And I've seen that even with my outreach that I've done here at Alabama State, which I'm not in the Department of Entomology, but when we have our STEM Saturdays and I bring out the insects that we that we used to have, I don't have any hissing cockroaches anymore, everyone wanted to hold them. It, it, it was the the insect of the, the character of the of the meeting. <laughs> A hit. <laughs> yeah, a hit. One thing that I have noticed that works well is if you go to like we did a lot of outreach in Newark, um, in New in New Jersey, which is Chocolate City. Um, and if you go there and have a lot of your resources or your PowerPoint slides or whatever just featuring white scientists, or you have a hand holding an insect and it's a white person's hand, mm -hmm. I think that is kind of yeah. sending a bit of a mixed message. And so what we've really tried to do is be, you know, curate the images, curate the messages that we're giving so they that they reflect the diversity that we want to see. And that can be a good tool, I think, is, is you know, be careful and, and conscious in the decisions of the images and, and things that you use in your teaching materials, is what I would say. Yeah. I really love that, Jessica. I really love that. 
And, and I agree, the same is true if you're lecturing in a university, right? Quite often all the imagery is not, not uh, inclusive. Um, but I'd say to sort of build on what Michelle said as well, you could build in a, a collecting component um, and that gives the students some feeling of empowerment. So we always have, they were fairly cheap. We got a bunch of little kid collecting kits. Um, and I remember being in places like that were basically, um, you know, really urban with not much on the school grounds in terms of vegetation and thinking, oh, we're not sure what they're going to get. They got a ton of ants and they were so excited. <laughs> and we got all, of all the stuff about ants and they were it just, it's a totally different thing when you collect it yourself and you can yeah. watch it. And then we showed yeah. them where to put them back. And, you know, it was really engaging. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, I'll ask this one from Laura M who identifies as a Hispanic female. And um, she is basically just looking for advice um, on how to react when you experience discrimination um, in the course of your work. So I know that's a, that's a hard high level one, but. I don't know that there's an easy answer and I think it will depend on the person in the situation. I'm not sure what my co-panelists think, but there have been times where I didn't react well, and by that I mean I internalized the discrimination and went home and felt sad and it disrupted my work or my week or my life or my interactions with my children. And I would say that I would count that as a not handling it well um, type of example. Um, and I think over time I've gotten better at um, becoming less conflict averse um, and really kind of calling out things and, and making us carving out a space for myself to feel, feel safe. But I think every situation might be slightly different. Um, so I don't know that there's one specific answer that will work, but I think the advice, the only advice I would have to say is that whatever your response is, make sure that it's not gonna end up hurting you more than the event already has. Discrimination is painful and it lasts a lot. The words uh, are gone. They're no longer floating in an air bubble, but the, the pain lasts for, for quite some time. But finding a way to have it not disrupt um, the work and research that you're doing uh, is is really important to find out how you can how what works for you to to make sure that that happens. And just to add to what Jessica uh, alluded to, I thought her response was was very well uh, crafted. But don't also let it defeat your spirit. Um, you're bound to face challenges. I I certainly have had my share of challenges in my career. But you show up the next day. You dust it off. And I know that's easier said than done. If, if you need to take a moment to internalize and regroup and consider your response, then do that. But don't not go go back to the field or don't not go back to the lab or to that meeting, the next opportunity that you have. You know, that's showing up again and again. That's part of, I think, how you overcome um, and you prove your worth, your worthiness and the fact that you belong and your opinions matter. Yeah, yeah, and it can help to have some phrases in mind if you do decide you want to respond in the moment. So some of my favorite are, "Oh, what do you mean by that? Uh, can you can you flesh that out for me? I'm I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I use a lot <laughs> because once people are forced to start explaining it, they sometimes will sort of twig." <laughs> <laughs> that either this is actually racist, what I'm saying, because a lot of people don't realize, right? Or, okay, now other people are going to hear that that's racist. So either of those yeah. can shut down the situation sometimes. But sometimes right. you just need to walk away. And especially if you had white allies in the room, say, like, what happened to me? To, like, I say to my white allies, that that really shook me. Um, I don't know how that looked to you. And they'll say, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you or whatever, um, or that they didn't realize, in which case I'll let them know. I feel safe telling you what that was. That maybe you didn't recognize and next time they'll recognize it yeah great thank you all so that all that was a really that was a really kind of inspiring and mix of super tactical stuff and doable things and also just the encouragement to not let it impact your work because that's ultimately the you know I don't know. I don't know how to talk about this any better than any um, other like white person who's just getting used to having these conversations but I think hearing yeah, the, what's really important for people to understand is that it does, it impacts you as a human and it also impacts the actual work. And so when you ask someone, why do you need to talk about this as a scientist? It's because of the kinds of things and stories that you just shared and because of the questions that um, that our viewer just asked. So thank you so much again for being here. And I was going to read this last comment from Anne who said, um, I'm so delighted that you are not only encouraging people of color to explore different careers, but also encouraging young girls to look into STEM careers. You are all amazing. And I think she's right. 
thank <laughs> so you. thank you. Yeah, and viewers, we're gonna drop links to um, each of our panelists' Twitter accounts and related websites and any of the resources mentioned today in comments. Um, so yeah, please share it widely, follow all our panelists, check out Black and Entomology Week, um, Black and Ento Week, sorry, and um, yeah, just stay involved, keep watching. Thank you all so much again for being Thank here. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Take care. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs>